Savior below, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do bow to adore you. Move our hearts in worship and praise for the blessings because you have made us your special people. Individually, you've called us each to be your child, and yet you gather us as your family. Inspire our worship and grow our faith that in faith we might learn to love one another more as we love you more. Bless us now as we study your word. Teach us from the events of old that yet have meaning today and move through our minds, our hearts, and our spirits that we might know you better and might more resemble your Son each and every day. Guide us now. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're continuing our study in Esther. The uh, text is on pages 7 and 8 in your bulletin. We're looking at Esther chapter 8. And there's a unique feature about this chapter. It's, it's the, kind of the number 4. It, it, the number 4 is not there, but there are going to be three occurrences in this chapter where we see four things described, four things emphasized. And for that reason, number four plays, plays a role in this chapter. And I want you to think of the biblical importance of that number, number four. We got four corners of the earth referred to in the Bible. We've got the four rivers of paradise described in Genesis chapter two. You've got four winds of heaven. You've got four acts of judgment described by the prophets. We got the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You're probably familiar with most of those. The number four refers to the creative work of God, universal truth. Now, when you think of the number four and God's creative work, what should come to mind is day four, day four of creation. Now, all of you are going, okay, day four, first day of life, second day. What was the fourth day? What did God do on the fourth day? On the fourth day, he created the sun and the moon. And that idea of demarcation, the sun and the moon were to mark day and night. And the sun and the moon were for the seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. The idea that things were defined. The fourth day brings us definition. And the four, the four in Esther becomes significant. Let's begin reading at uh, verse 1 of chapter 8. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had disclosed what he was to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had taken away from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther sent Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now, the first thing that should come to mind is, what do you mean on that day? Well, you got to remember the context of the book and what's happened. Haman had been raised up by Ahasuerus, the king, into a place of importance. And he made a deal with the king for the execution of the Jewish nation. But when that plan was revealed by Esther to the king in chapter 7, Haman becomes the one who dies. Haman had a plan to kill Mordecai. He had built a gallows by his house, 75 feet high. He was going to hang Mordecai on it in front of everybody. And because of Haman's evil deeds, the king hung Haman on that gallows. And so the king rewards Esther and rewards Mordecai. The king gives to Esther the house of Haman. This is now your house. And Esther goes and gives it to Mordecai. But the king raises up Mordecai. Now Esther, for the first time in the book, has revealed who Mordecai is. She's a Jew, Mordecai's a relative. Mordecai, who's responsible for saving the king's life, the king's life is now honored even greatly. The signet ring that the king had given to Haman is now given to Mordecai, and Mordecai is raised up as that position of power. But this has not alleviated the problem. The problem is still that there's a law in place that on the 13th day of the 12th month, the month Adar, all the Jews are to be annihilated. All the Jews are to be persecuted and killed. So there has to be something else happening. So as we turn to verse 3, it says, 
Then Esther spoke again to the king, fell at his feet, wept, and implored him to avert the evil scheme of Haman the Agathite and his plot which he had devised against the Jews. Notice there, the four actions described, the four actions that describe Esther's approach to the king. Here's where four becomes interesting. This is the line of demarcation. God is going to change the picture. Esther does what? She speaks, she falls, she weeps, and she implores. She's after the life of her people. She's not going to be silent. But once again, she has the problem. The day has passed. The banquet she has, has thrown are over. And now she has to be bidden to come into the king's presence again. We have the summary statement of what's going to happen at the beginning of this paragraph. She speaks to him. She falls down before him. She cries and she implores him. Four things happen because there's still the law that Haman had the king in act. And now what's going to happen? The king extended the golden scepter to Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king. There again, as we saw earlier in the book, Esther is received into the king's presence. He gladly welcomes his favorite queen into his presence. And he's going to say, then she said, if it pleases the king, and if I have found favor before him and the matter seems proper to the king, I am, and, and I am pleasing in his sight, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of the Hamathite, the Agathe, 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 which he wrote to destroy the Jews who were in all the king's provinces. For what, for how, for how can I endure to see the calamity which will befall my people? And how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? So King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given the house of Haman to Esther, and him they have hanged on the gallows because he has stretched out his hand against the Jews. Now you write to the Jews as you see fit in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for a decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring may not be revoked. There at the end of that paragraph we get the problem. A decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed by the, with the king's signet ring may not be revoked. According to the law of the Medes and Persians, we're in the Persian Empire a huge empire this time, as the king wills and decrees it, as he puts something into law, stamps his ring of approval on it, it cannot be changed. The king's word is the authoritative word, and even he cannot change it. So the, the decree that Haman had the king write is going forth. Now Esther and the king have this conversation. Okay? She speaks, she falls, she weeps, she implores. She's begging for the life of her people. She does not blame the king, Ahasuerus, for anything that Esther, uh, anything that Haman did. The king was in league with Haman. He was going to collect a large bounty, a large spoil from all the Jews that Haman killed. Haman was going to collect the spoil and give it, give portion to the king. So the king was at fault here. But Esther does not blame the king. She lays the blame only on Haman, diplomatically, with a foresight. She's gracious. Yes, King, you made a mistake, but it wasn't you who I'm going to blame. It's all Haman. But what can we do about this? And, and, and the king says, well, now, Esther, I, I have blessed you this day. I've given you, we've, we've killed your enemy, Haman. We've given you the house. We've rewarded you. We've raised up Mordecai. So here's what I want you to do. I can't revoke the law. I want you to, you and Mordecai, write whatever you need to write, and you seal with my signet ring to protect your people. That's the implication here. So Esther has the fourfold action as she goes to the king to, to draw this line of demarcation. We're no longer going to talk about killing the Jews. Now we're going to talk about saving the Jews. So the queen and Mordecai, Esther and Mordecai get together and they start writing. Continuing our reading. So the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, that is the month seven, uh, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded uh, to the Jews, 
the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces, which extended from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to every province according to its script, and to every people according to their language, as well as to the Jews according to their script and their language. He wrote in the name of the king Ahasuerus, and sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horses, riding on steeds sired by the royal stud. In them the king granted the Jews who were in each city the right to assemble and to defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate the entire army of any people or province which might attack them, including children, women, and to plunder their spoil. Once again, there come four things. Four things, four instructions given by Mordecai to protect the Jews. First of all, you have the right to assemble. On the day, the 13th day of the 12th month, when they're going to kill you, you assemble. You get prepared. You get ready. And secondly, you can defend yourself. You don't have to take it. You can stand and guard. Thirdly, you can do to them what they were going to do to you. You can kill them. You can annihilate them, women and children. Anyone who would seek your life, you can kill. Fourth, you can take their spoil. You see how the tables have turned? You see how the line in the sand, so to speak, is drawn? No, it's not going to be the Jews who are persecuted. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be a fight. The Jews do not have to take it. They now have full authority to work out what the problem is. This is a message of salvation, a message of deliverance. On that, so continue on, on one day, in all the province of King Ahasuerus, the 13th day of the 12th month, that's the month Adar, a copy of the edict to be issued as law in each and every province was published to all the peoples, so that the Jews would be ready on this day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers, hastened and impelled by the king's command, went out, riding on royal steeds, and the decree was given out to the citadel in Susa. Twice we have mentioned of the horses and the speed. These were royal horses that carried the message with great speed. God's word was going forth to save his people without hesitation, without delay. Get that word out there. Get that word to the people. My chosen people now who are in slavery, who have been taken from their promised land, are now people that have the right to protect themselves, to defend themselves. Four times Esther had actions and words to the king. Four times we get instructions from Mordecai to the Jews as to how they're to defend themselves. Assemble, get ready, uh, defend, uh, kill, take the spoil, those actions. These went out with great haste, great speed, the message of God is to go out. Finishing the reading, verse 15, Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a large crown of gold and a garment of fine linen purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. For the, Jew, for the Jews there was light and gladness and joy and honor. In each and every province and each and every city, wherever the king's commandment and his decree arrived, there was gladness and joy for the Jews a feast and a holiday. And many among the peoples of the land became Jews for the dread of the Jews had fallen upon them. Notice, notice finally, the four reactions of the Jews concerning their deliverance. It was light. There was no longer darkness. It was gladness. It was joy. And it was honor. The Jews were getting recognition as God's people. They were being honored by the king and his representatives. They found a light in the darkness of that tunnel. They found hope in what God was doing them. Here, the line is drawn, so to speak. Here's a time when everything's going to turn around. God is saying, okay, I'm dividing what happened before with what's going to happen. No longer are my people going to be the ones persecuted. Now my people are going to be the ones who can stand and defend themselves. It's time. And notice the reaction. As this word goes out from Ethiopia to India, and the Jews hear about it, and the people of the nation hear about it, 
many people become Jews. It's one of the only times we see any indication in the Old Testament of a mass conversion of Gentiles to become Jewish in nature. The next time we'll see that is on the day of Pentecost when they go from being Jewish to being Christian. But now they go from being Gentiles to being Jews because the fear of the Jews is upon them. They saw that God was blessing his people. Four is the number of God's divine universal truth that marks off the past from the future. Four is that dividing line. And God has divided and said no longer. No longer will my people be the ones put upon. Now my people are the ones who will go forth in victory. Now, of course, as we read this chapter, we need to think in terms not only of the events of the Old Testament, but what these events reflect to us as we look toward the New Testament. We always say that the Old Testament, uh, you know, points to Christ, and the New Testament reveals Christ. Well, if this points to Christ, how should we find Christ in here? Well, Mordecai becomes the Christ-like figure for us. Mordecai is the humble servant in humility who brings a message that saves the king's life. Mordecai is the one now who brings the message to save God's people. Mordecai becomes like Christ. Christ comes in humility. He doesn't come as a king. He comes as a baby. He walks among us. He talks with us. He teaches us his way. And then he delivers that message of salvation. As Mordecai becomes the one who is honored as he goes forth from the palace, Jesus is the one who gains honor as he rises victorious over death. And we await for that time when the sky will part and he will come as king to rule forevermore. This chapter becomes, for the Jews, salvation. This chapter points us to Christ and the cross as the line that saves us. It's no longer law, it's now gospel. It's now forgiveness and reconciliation. It's now that good message which went forth with speed in the Old Testament on these steeds, which now needs to go forth in speed with our words and our actions. May we take the example of Mordecai and see in him a Christ-likeness that we should embody and that we should resemble. And in all things, may we take the message of this salvation, that God is delivering his people today just as he delivered them long ago, that God will raise us to victory and that there is light, joy, and honor for us. And rejoice as the Jews did. And celebrate because God's news to us is good. May we rejoice in all that God's doing as all he did long ago, he still does today. Amen. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.